the beginning of all time, God made our world. At first it was dark and empty, but God knew his power would change it into a beautiful place. God made light, so there was darkness and light. That's good, said God. There was water everywhere. God decided to keep some water in the clouds and some on the earth. So God made the sky for the clouds. He kept some of the water stored in them for when he needed rain. That's good, said God. God moved the water into special places on the earth and called them seas. The water looked beautiful. The light shone on it. The edges of the water curled over onto the land in white waves. In some places it roared around rocks and threw sparkling spray up into the air. That's good, said God. Now we have sea and land. God covered the dry land with plants. Little green shoots grew to tall golden grain for the harvest. There were trees with pink and white blossom. That's good, said God. There will soon be ripe fruit to eat and nuts to enjoy. There were shiny leaves of vines climbing around the trees. God could smell the scent of the flowers he had made. What a beautiful earth it will be, he said. He felt the rough bark on the huge oak trees. He saw the ferns uncurling their leaves from the damp earth. That's good, said God. God knew the plants needed warm light. He made the sun to shine in the daytime. That will keep my plants strong and green, he said. God knew he was going to make some animals who would be awake at night. They would need a light too, but not such a bright, hot one as the sun. So God made the moon and stars. That's good, said God. God watched the waves of the sea splashing on the sand. He saw the sun shining on the water. The air smelled of plants and flowers. These are good places to live, he said. I will make fish to enjoy the water, and I will make birds with soft feathers to fly in the air. That's good, said God. Now we have fish in the sea and birds in the air. Now I shall make some tiny creatures like this ant and this buzzing bee, said God. I shall make some huge animals like this elephant and that rhinoceros. Some animals will move slowly like this sloth. Some will be very fast like that cheetah. There will be animals of every size and shape. That's Good, said God. God made some of the animals with soft fur and some with hard shells. The monkeys had strong tails to help them climb and the owls had big eyes to see in the dark. Every animal in the sea, the air and on the land was perfect. God looked at them all and smiled. That's good, said God. Now the earth was ready for people to enjoy. I will make people to live here, said God. So he made a man and a woman. That is good, said God. They will have children, God said. Then there will be plenty of people to take care of my new land. God called the man Adam and the woman Eve. They were his special friends. God showed the man and the woman all the things he had made for them to enjoy. Thank you, they said. This earth is a beautiful place. God looked at the earth. Yes, it is a beautiful place, he said. It is very good. Now I can rest and enjoy it. So God rested after all his work and enjoyed everything he had made.
In the very first days, when the earth was young, God walked in his beautiful garden. He loved to see all the animals he had made. Most of all, he loved to come and visit the man and woman he had made. They were his friends. Their names were Adam and Eve. God usually came to see them in the evening, before it was dark, when the air was cool. They told him what they had been doing in the day. Adam and Eve enjoyed the garden God had made. They looked after the plants. They picked the fruit and berries when they were ripe. God had said that the earth was for them to enjoy. They had chosen the names for the animals. They played with them. They splashed in the river. They watched the clouds. You may eat the fruit of all the trees in the garden, God said, except that one tree in the middle. It was easy to obey because there were plenty of other good things to eat. All the animals loved Adam and Eve. They were not afraid of each other. But there was one who was different. He was a cunning snake. He was not happy when he saw that the man and woman were friends with God. One day, when Eve was in the garden, the cunning snake said, Why don't you taste the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden? Didn't God say you could have anything you wanted to eat? We can eat anything from any of these beautiful trees and plants, said Eve. But we must never eat the fruit of that tree or we will die. How silly you are to believe that, hissed the cunning snake. You won't die. If you eat that fruit, you will know as much as God. Try it and see that I am right. Eve slowly turned and went to the tree. She put her arms round it and looked up into the leaves. The fruit was red and shiny. In the light of the sun, it was beautiful. It hung down quite low. She could just reach it. Eve took the fruit and bit it. It is really delicious, she said. The cunning snake crept under a bush and watched her. Soon, Adam came to look for her. He found her under the tree, eating the fruit. This is better than all the other fruit, she said. You taste it. She held the fruit out and the man bit it. Then the cunning snake smiled. But Adam and Eve felt suddenly afraid. They made clothes out of leaves to cover themselves. Oh dear, they said. When God comes to visit us, he will know we have disobeyed him. We must hide quickly. They had never hidden from God before because they were his friends. When God came in the evening, he called out, Where are you? Why are you afraid? Have you eaten the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden? Adam and Eve came slowly out from their hiding place. Why did you eat that fruit? said God. Adam pointed at Eve. She made me, he said. God said to Eve, why did you eat the fruit? Eve pointed at the cunning snake. He made me, she said. God said to Adam and Eve, You have spoiled all my plans for you because you have disobeyed me. Now you must go from my garden forever. From now on you will have to work hard. You will feel pain. I will never be able to meet you here again, and when you grow old, you will die. So Adam and Eve were sent away from the garden. God was sad that he could not trust them. The man and the woman were sad that they had disobeyed God. It was hard work to grow their own food. They were sad that the animals did not trust them anymore. But most of all, they missed having God as their friend.
first made the world, everything was good. But soon God was sad when he saw the people he had put in his beautiful world. They were not the way he had made them. They were unkind. They hurt one another. They did not even try to obey God anymore. God was sad and he was angry. The people who have disobeyed me must be punished. I shall send a great flood to wash the earth clean. My world will be as it was when I first made it. I shall begin all over again. There was just one man on earth who was God's friend. He was a good man, and God was pleased with him. His name was Noah. God told Noah what he was going to do, but he promised that Noah and his family would be safe. I have an important job for you to do. You will need to build an enormous boat. You will be safe inside while I wash the earth clean. God told Noah exactly how to build the special boat. It had many rooms, a roof, a window and a door in the side. God told Noah to make it from strong wood and to paint it with tar to keep out all the water. Noah worked hard. He had never made a boat before, but God told him just what to do. When it was finished, Noah took his whole family inside. They made sure they had all the food they needed. God said to Noah, You must take into the boat a pair of all the birds and animals I have made. You must look after them while the earth is made clean. So make sure you have the food each animal likes. Noah and his family made the animals comfortable in the rooms of the boat. They stored away the food they needed. When everything in the boat was as God wanted it, God shut the door of the boat. The people who had disobeyed him were left outside. Then God sent the rain. The rain came in a storm. It made a terrible noise on the roof of the boat, and it went on and on. Slowly the water rose. The boat began to float on the water. It rained for a long time. The animals wanted to get out and run on the grass. Noah's family wanted to live in a house again, but Noah said, you must wait. After many days, the rain stopped. The water was so deep it covered even the mountain tops. Then the wind began to blow and the boat drifted on the water. The wind blew and the water began to go down. One day, Noah's family could see the mountain tops poking up out of the water. Noah said, the birds need to stretch their wings. I will send out a raven. The raven flew off and did not come back. Then Noah sent out a dove, but the dove came back quickly. She could not find a dry place to rest. The next time Noah sent out the dove, she found a tree peeping up through the water. She broke off a twig with green leaves and took it back to the boat. One day the boat bumped onto some dry ground. The great flood was over. Noah said, God has kept his promise. The earth will soon be dry enough for us to live on. I will send out the dove again. Perhaps she will find a place to live. When the dove did not come back, Noah knew that the water had gone and the earth was dry. God said to Noah, My world is ready for you again. Bring out your family and all the animals. Noah and his family enjoyed being in the fresh air. They stood together to say thank you to God for keeping them safe in the flood. They thanked God for his beautiful world. I am sad that I had to flood my earth and wash away the people and good things I had made. I want you to live happy lives in my world. Look. They looked up and saw a beautiful shining rainbow. Whenever you see a rainbow, remember that I have promised never again to send a flood like this one. You know that I always keep my promises.
Abraham and his wife Sarah lived in the town of Ur, in the land of Babylon. One day, God told him to leave his home to go to a new land, a land which God would give to Abraham and his family. Abraham and Sarah had no children, but God said, I will give this new land to you and your children, and their children after them. You will be my people. Abraham was getting old, but he believed God's promise that he and Sarah would one day have a child. So they got ready for the journey. They packed their clothes and food. They said goodbye to all their friends, and they set off. Abraham and Sarah had no map. God showed them the way. It was a long, long journey, and at night they put up a big tent to sleep in. On and on they went through many countries. Abraham and Sarah were both old, but still they had no children. God said to them, Look at the grains of dust on the path. Look at the stars above your tent at night. One day your family will be as many as that, too many to count. And still Abraham trusted God. They were glad when they came to the new land. It had been such a long journey. There was no house to live in, so they lived in their big tent. One day Abraham saw some men going by. Please come in and sit down, he said. We will get you something to eat. That would be good, because we have an important message for you. Your wife, Sarah, is going to have a baby boy. Sarah heard what they said and laughed. Oh, it is too late, she said. We are too old now. God was sorry that Sarah did not believe the men he had sent. But soon Sarah knew that the message was true. She was going to have a baby. Perhaps nothing is too hard for God, she said. When the baby was born, Abraham and Sarah were very happy. They called him Isaac. God had kept his promise. Abraham and Sarah loved their little son. They watched him play outside the tent. The years passed. Isaac grew up tall and strong. His parents were very proud of him. They thanked God for keeping his promise. God had given Abraham a new land, and he'd given him a son. How Abraham loved Isaac. God loved Abraham, but he wanted to make sure that Abraham trusted him just as much as when he had first come to the new land. So God said to Abraham, Take this son you love so much and go to the mountains you can see. I want you to offer him to me as a sacrifice. Poor Abraham. He wished there was some other way to show God his love, but he obeyed God. He took Isaac to the mountains with some firewood and a knife. Isaac looked at the heap of stones on the mountain. He saw the knife and the wood. What shall we offer to God on the stones to show him that we love him? He asked. Abraham was very sad, but he told Isaac that they must trust God to give them something to put on the stones. God did not want Isaac to die. He did not want Abraham and Sarah to be unhappy. He just wanted to be sure that Abraham would still trust and obey him. Abraham put Isaac on top of the stones. He picked up the knife to kill Isaac. Then God called, Abraham, stop. Look, I have given you the animal in that bush behind you. God knew now that Abraham really did trust him. He would obey whatever the cost. Abraham and Isaac were so happy. They thanked God as they made the sacrifice. They talked about what had happened as they went down the mountain. They were so glad that they could trust God. And as God had promised, through Isaac and his children, Abraham's family did become a great nation.
Abraham and his son Isaac lived in the land of Canaan. Many years before, God had promised that Abraham and his family would live in this land. So they had settled there and were very happy. They trusted and loved God. They knew God cared about them. Abraham was very old. His wife Sarah had died. He said to himself, I must make sure that Isaac has a wife to love him. I don't want him to be on his own when I die. Abraham knew that Isaac should have a wife from his own people, but they lived a long way away. So Abraham decided to send his most trusted servant back to his hometown to find a wife for Isaac. Abraham called his servant to him. He was a good man. He looked after Abraham. You are the person I can trust most, Abraham told him. Promise me that you will go back to the town where my family lives and choose a wife for Isaac from my own people. The servant was worried. How can I make her come back with me? Abraham told him that God would show him what to do. So the servant set out on the long journey. It was hot and dusty. The hills were steep. He had never been that way before. He took with him ten camels and presents of gold so that Abraham's family would know that the man who wanted a wife was rich. At last he came to the town and rested in the shade by a well. Lord God, please keep your promise and help me. Show me the right wife for Isaac. Here are some girls coming to the well for water. I will ask one of them for a drink. If she gives me one and then offers water for my camels, I will know she is the one you have chosen. All the people of the town used water from the well. Soon a beautiful girl came to the well. She carried a water jar on her shoulder. Please, could I have a drink? Asked the servant. Yes, of course. And I will give some to your thirsty camels, too. The servant was so happy. He had found the right wife for Isaac. He gave her the gold rings he had in his bag. She told him her name was Rebecca. The servant thanked God for showing him which girl to choose. Abraham's servant knew he must meet Rebecca's family and tell them the whole story. Is there somewhere I can stay for the night? He asked Rebecca. Yes, there is room with my family. Come and meet them. The servant went to Rebecca's house. Her family were very surprised. They saw the gold rings and heard how God had sent the servant to choose a wife for his master's son. We will miss her if she goes with you, but Rebecca must decide. Rebecca said she would go with the servant and be Isaac's wife. The next day, Rebecca and the servant went back along the way to Canaan. Rebecca took her own servant with her. When they were near Abraham's home, Isaac came to meet them. When he saw Rebecca, he loved her and wanted her to be his wife. Come to meet my father Abraham and see where we live, Isaac said. Rebecca was glad she had been brave enough to come. Rebecca became Isaac's wife. Isaac and Rebecca were very happy, and that made Abraham happy too. They were all glad they had trusted God to find Isaac the right wife. Isaac lived in the land of Canaan. He was old and blind. 
His wife Rebecca looked after him. Their sons were twins called Esau and Jacob. They loved them both very much. When they were little boys, Esau and Jacob enjoyed playing together. There was always plenty to do around the tent where they lived. There were hills to climb and donkeys to ride. But as they grew older, they started to enjoy different things. Let's go out hunting for meat, Esau would say. But Jacob would answer, no thanks, I'd rather stay at home. Rebecca loved Jacob best. She was glad that he stayed at home. They talked together as they worked. Jacob knew that even though they were twins, Isaac would give Esau all the special blessings of God kept for the first son because he was born first. It's just not fair, Jacob would say to his mother. Isaac was glad that Esau loved hunting. He enjoyed eating the meat Esau caught while he listened to his stories. He loved to hear about the hills and the fields and the world he could not see. One day, when Esau was out hunting, Rebecca called to Jacob, Quickly, go and put on some of Esau's clothes. We will make your father give you the special blessing before Esau comes back. Rebecca tied goatskins around Jacob's arms to make them feel hairy like Esau's. Then Jacob took some food to his father. Isaac was blind, so he put out his hand to touch his son. Is that you, Esau? Yes, father, said Jacob, making his voice like Esau's. So Isaac gave Jacob the special blessing of God, kept for the first son. Jacob and Rebecca were glad. They knew now that Jacob would be a rich man. Isaac's blessing promised him a long life and success. Then Esau came in from hunting. He cooked the meat and took it to his father. Esau asked his father for the special blessing. Then Isaac knew he had been tricked. You are too late, my dear son. Esau was furious when he heard what had happened. My brother is a cheat. I should have God's special blessing. Please give it to me, he begged. I can't, said Isaac sadly. I gave it to Jacob, and I cannot take it back. I will kill him, said Esau. Rebecca heard what Esau said, so she sent Jacob away. Go and stay in the land where my brother lives, she said. I will send you a message when it is safe for you to come home. So Jacob began his journey to Haran. It was a very long way. When night time came, he was tired. He found a dry place on the ground and used a big smooth stone as a pillow. As he slept, he had a dream. He dreamed of angels on a stairway going up to the sky. He heard a voice say, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac. I will be with you on your journey and bring you safely home. Jacob knew that God hated his cheating and he was very afraid. But God had said he would keep the promise he had made to Abraham for his whole family. In Haran, Jacob found his uncle Laban. He worked hard for him for many years, though Laban was a bigger cheat than Jacob. Jacob became a rich man with sheep and goats of his own. He wanted to marry Laban's beautiful daughter, Rachel, but Laban tricked him into marrying her older sister. Brother Esau stayed in Canaan. He felt cheated and sad. Isaac and Rebekah both died, but Esau worked hard. He had a family and they lived in a big tent. He often thought, I wish I knew where Jacob was. I would like to see him again. One day, God told Jacob to travel back to Canaan, the land God had promised to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. Jacob was afraid of meeting Esau. I do not deserve the care and love you have shown me all these years, he said to God. But please take care of me now as I meet Esau. Jacob sent presents of sheep and goats ahead of him in case his brother was still angry, but Esau ran to meet Jacob. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. He was so glad Jacob had come back. God had helped Esau to forgive Jacob. He had kept his promise to bring Jacob home safe and sound. The two brothers were friends again.
There was an old man called Jacob living in Canaan. His wife had died, but he was never lonely because he had 12 sons. Jacob loved all his sons, but one was special. His name was Joseph, and Jacob loved him best of all. The other brothers were jealous because Jacob made a big fuss over Joseph. He even gave Joseph a special coat to wear. Joseph was not very nice. For one thing, he always ran and told his father about what his brothers were doing. One night, Joseph dreamed that all his family were sheaves of wheat in a field. His sheaf stood up straight and tall. All the other sheaves bowed down to his sheaf. When Joseph told his brothers about the dream, they were really angry. Do you think we will bow down to you, they said. You must be joking. Another time, Joseph dreamed he was looking up into the sky. His family were the sun, the moon and the stars. They all bowed down to him. Even his father was upset when he heard about that dream. What kind of dream is that, he said. Be quiet. His brothers hated him still more. Jacob was a rich man. He had huge flocks of sheep and goats. The animals needed grass to eat and water to drink. Often they had to be taken a long way away to find the grass and water. Jacob's sons went with the animals to take care of them. Sometimes they walked many days just looking for grass. Joseph stayed at home. One day, Jacob's sons had been away with the sheep for a long time. Jacob said to Joseph, I want you to go and find your brothers. Take them some food and see if they are well. Joseph walked and walked. His brothers saw him coming. They laughed behind their hands. Here comes the great dreamer, they said. One of them said, I've had enough of his dreams. He's only come now so that he can go back and tell our father about us. Let's kill him. Another one said, why don't we just throw him in that well over there? They all thought that was the best idea. They took off Joseph's special coat and threw him into the dried up well. Then they sat down to enjoy the food Joseph had brought them. Suddenly, they saw a long line of camels walking slowly over the hills. They knew the men with the camels were going to Egypt to sell their goods. I know, one brother said. Let's sell Joseph to those men. They can take him to Egypt to work. Then we'll never see him again. They shouted to the men to stop. Then they pulled Joseph up out of the well. What will you pay us for this strong young man, they asked. Joseph's brothers sold him to the men for 20 silver coins and watched the camels go off to Egypt with Joseph walking behind. They tore Joseph's coat and dipped it in the blood of an animal. The beautiful new coat looked horrible now. When they went home, they tried to look unhappy. Look what we found, they said to Jacob, holding up the coat. Do you think Joseph has been killed by a wild animal? Jacob took the coat and held it up. Joseph must be dead. Jacob was so sad, he did not see that his sons were glad to get rid of Joseph. The brothers did not know that God had important work for Joseph to do in Egypt. But first, there were things Joseph must learn. Jacob was very sad. He thought that he would never see Joseph again. He did not know then that this was not the end of the story.
Joseph lived in a land called Egypt, but his real home was in Canaan where his family lived. There he had a father called Jacob who loved him very much. He also had 11 brothers. Joseph found his new life very hard. In Canaan, he had been the son his father Jacob loved most. Here in Egypt, people stared at him because he came from another country. You can see he's not one of us, they said. In Canaan, he had been able to have everything he wanted because his father was rich. In Egypt, he had been sold to a rich man. He was a slave. But he did his work so well that before long he had an important job. He had to look after the rich man's house. God had not forgotten Joseph, but he wanted Joseph to change. He did not want him to be a spoiled boy who got his brothers into trouble. He wanted Joseph to trust him and to become a man other people could trust. One day, Joseph was put in prison for something he had not done. Even in prison, God helped him. The prison was horrible. It was dark and smelly. The jailer saw how hard Joseph worked, so he put him in charge of all the other prisoners. Joseph made friends with the prisoners. When two of them had puzzling dreams, Joseph helped them. God will tell me what the dreams mean, he said, and he explained them. In three days' time, you will be set free, he said to one of the men. Please, don't forget to ask someone to let me out, too. This man's job was to bring wine to the king himself. Sure enough, he was set free and worked for the king, just as Joseph had said. But two years passed, and Joseph was still in prison. Then the king had a dream, and the man remembered Joseph. I know someone who can explain your dream, he said to the king. His God helps him. So the king sent for Joseph. I have had a very strange dream, he said. My servant says you can explain it. My God will help me, said Joseph. The king dreamed he was standing by the great river of Egypt. He saw seven fat cows come out of the water and start to eat the grass. Then he saw seven skinny cows come out of the water. They ate up the seven fat cows, but stayed as thin as before. I wish I knew what it meant, he cried. Joseph told the king, God wants you to know that there are going to be seven years when we will all have plenty of food to eat, but you must save some of the food because for seven years after that, there will not be enough. I am glad God told us, said the king. We must store up all the food we can. We shall need someone in charge. I think that you should do it. So Joseph became the most important man in Egypt. He stored up the food when there was plenty. Then when there was no harvest, the people came to buy food from him. People came from other lands to buy food too. Even in Canaan, where Joseph's father lived, the harvests were poor and the people were very hungry. One day, when Joseph was busy in the storehouse, he saw his own brothers coming through the door. They did not know this great man was Joseph, and he did not tell them right away. First, he wanted to find out if they were still as cruel. When he knew they had really changed, Joseph told them who he was. They were very ashamed. But Joseph said, Please don't be sad. Look how God has cared for me. Go and bring Jacob, my father. I want you all to come and live with me in Egypt. There are five more hungry years to come. Jacob had been so sure that Joseph was dead. How glad he was to see him again. He was happy to live in Egypt where there was plenty of food. Most of all, Jacob was glad that Joseph was a man who could be trusted. God had changed him, and he had changed the cruel brothers. Jacob thanked God for taking care of Joseph in Egypt.
There were many Israelites living in the land of Egypt. It was not their own country. The Egyptians looked at the Israelites who lived in their country and said, there are so many of them. They will soon be taking over Egypt. There was a new king in Egypt. He looked at all the Israelites and said, something must be done. There are too many of them. They might fight us and turn us out of our own land. They are useful slaves, but we must think of a way to make them tired and weak so that they cannot fight as soldiers. So the king of Egypt made the Israelites work very hard. They had to start early in the morning. They went back to their homes when it was late at night. The Israelites had to make bricks for the Egyptian cities. They had to do all the hard work on the farms too. They became hot and tired, but they were still stronger than the Egyptians. The Egyptians were afraid of them. I have a good idea, said the king. We will kill all their baby boys when they are born. Soon they will have no young men to fight us. So the king of Egypt told the people, all the Israelite baby boys must be killed. The Israelites were very sad. They loved their baby boys. They wanted them to grow up to be strong young men. One Israelite woman who had a baby boy said to her little girl, Miriam, I can't let them kill him. I want to watch him grow up. I love him so much. So she made a tiny floating cradle for him and put it on the river among the reeds. Every day they put him in his special hiding place. His sister Miriam sat on the riverbank and watched. One day Miriam saw the king's daughter walking by the river. She had some servants with her. Miriam did not know what to do. She could not hide the cradle herself and there was no time to get her mother. What's that? asked the princess, pointing to the tiny floating cradle. They pulled the cradle to the riverbank, opened the lid and looked inside. There was the little baby. He laughed when he saw the princess. He put out his hands to touch her face. What a lovely baby, said the princess. He is an Israelite. I wish I had someone to look after him. Then I could keep him. Then Miriam came down the bank to the path. I know someone who would look after him for you. I'll just go and get her. Miriam ran to get her mother. The princess did not know that she was the baby's own mother. Please look after him, said the princess to the baby's mother. When he is old enough, he can come and live at my palace. I shall call him Moses. Miriam and her mother were so happy to have the baby boy back. No one could kill him now because they knew that Moses belonged to the princess. Every day the little family watched Moses grow. He learned to walk and talk. He laughed and played with Miriam by the river. When Moses was old enough, he went to live at the palace with the princess. He grew up as a rich young man. He knew he was not an Egyptian. He often saw the Israelites as they worked at the palace. He saw how tired and sad they were. I wish I could help them, he said. God had not forgotten the Israelites. He knew they needed a strong leader to take them away from Egypt. God wanted them to go back to the land of Canaan. I will give Moses the job of leading the Israelites out of Egypt, said God, and I will be with him just as I was with Joseph. But that is another story.
Moses lived in the palace of the king of Egypt. He had everything he could wish for, but he was not an Egyptian, he was an Israelite. The other Israelites were slaves. They had to work very hard, making bricks all day in the hot sun. If they stopped, they were whipped. One day, Moses saw an Egyptian being very cruel to an Israelite. He was so angry that he knocked the Egyptian down and killed him. Moses was afraid of what the king would do when he found out. So he ran away from the city to a place where no one knew who he was. He worked as a shepherd. He often thought about the Israelites as he looked after the sheep. One day, as Moses watched over his sheep, he saw a bush that was on fire. That's funny. The leaves are still green, even though it is burning. Then he heard a voice saying, Be careful, Moses. This is a very special place. I am the same God who spoke to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I have seen how my people are suffering. You are going to lead them out of Egypt. Go and speak to the king for me. Moses was afraid. The king will never listen to me. He will not even believe that you have spoken to me. But God told Moses to take his brother Aaron with him. Moses and Aaron went to see the king. We have a message from our God. Our God says, let my people go. I don't know your God, said the king. I will not let you go. And he gave orders to his men to make the Israelite slaves work even harder. God told Moses and Aaron that he would make the king let the Israelites go. If you don't let us go, the river will turn to blood, Moses said to the king. The king would not listen, and the river turned to blood. I will still not let the Israelites go, said the king. God had promised Moses that he would lead the Israelites out of Egypt to their own land. So Moses went to the king again and said, Our God says, let my people go. But the king would not listen. He was angry. The frogs that lived by the river did not like it now. They came up into the town. They jumped all over the rooms in the palace. When the king saw all the frogs, he said, Tell the Israelites they can go. But when the frogs had gone, he changed his mind. After the frogs, there were gnats everywhere, biting everyone. The Israelites can go, shouted the king. But when the gnats had gone, he changed his mind. God then sent swarms of flies to the land of Egypt. They were everywhere, except where the Israelites lived. The animals which belonged to the Egyptians became sick. The Israelite animals were well. The king kept saying, yes, you can go. But when the flies went away and the animals were well, he changed his mind. You must stay here, he said. Moses and Aaron told the king, If you don't let the Israelites go, you will be covered in boils and there will be hailstorms too. The king did not care. Soon the Egyptians had sore boils all over them. Then there was a terrible hailstorm. It beat down the plants and hurt the people, except where the Israelites lived. You can go away now, said the king. But when the boils went and the hail stopped, the king changed his mind. Moses told the king that God would send locusts to eat his grain, and that is what happened. Then God said he would make the daytime as dark as night. When these terrible things happened, the king wanted to get rid of the Israelites. But as soon as they stopped, the king changed his mind. Then God said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to get ready to go. Tell the king that tonight I am coming to Egypt. Because he has not obeyed me, the oldest child in each family will die. Moses told the Israelites to mark the doors of their own houses with blood from an animal. Then their oldest child would be safe. It all happened as God said it would. All God's people were safe. Then the king of Egypt asked Moses to take the Israelites away. God has given us so much trouble, he said. He must want you very much. So God took the Israelites out of Egypt. In the daytime, he led them with a special cloud. At night, there was a finger of fire so that they could not lose their way. At last, they were on their way to Canaan, the land God had promised to them.
We hope you've enjoyed these stories. If you would like to listen to more, there are another four cassettes available. If you like to read a story as well as see it on the screen, there are 52 books you can buy. These are produced by Lion Publishing and have the same illustrations and text as the cassettes so that you can easily follow the story.